Section 5 of Psychopathology of Everyday Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Read by Mary Schneider. Chapter 5 Mistakes in Speech. Although the ordinary material of speech of our mother tongue seems to be guarded against forgetting, its application, however, more often succumbs to another disturbance which is familiar to us as slips of the tongue. What we observe in normal persons as slips of the tongue gives the same impression as the first step of the so-called paraphasias, which manifest themselves under pathological conditions. I am in the exceptional position of being about to refer to a previous work on the subject. In the year 1895, Meringer and C. Meyer published a study on mistakes in speech and reading, with whose viewpoints I do not agree. One of the authors, who is the spokesman in the text, is a philologist actuated by a linguistic interest to examine the rules governing those slips. He hoped to deduce from these rules the existence, quote, of a definite psychic mechanism whereby the sounds of a word of a sentence and even the words themselves would be associated and connected with one another in a quite peculiar manner the authors grouped the examples of speech mistakes collected by them first according to purely descriptive viewpoints such as interchangings for example milo of venus instead of venus of milo as anticipations for example, the shoes made her sore, instead of the shoes made her feet sore, as echoes and postpositions, as contaminations, for example, I will soon him home, instead of I will soon go home and will see him, and substitutions, for example, he entrusted his money to a savings crank, instead of a savings bank. Besides these principal categories, there are some others of lesser importance or of lesser significance for our purpose. In this grouping, it makes no difference whether the transposition, disfigurement, fusion, etc., affects single sounds of the word or syllable, or whole words of the concerned sentence. To explain the various forms of mistakes in speech, Meringer assumes a varied psychic value of phonetics. As soon as the innervation affects the first syllable of a word, or the first word of a sentence, the stimulating process immediately strikes the succeeding sounds and the following words, and in so far as these innervations are synchronous, they may affect some changes in one another. The stimulus of the psychically more intensive sound rings before or continues echoing, and thus disturbs the less important process of innervation. It is necessary, therefore, to determine which are the most important sounds of a word. Meringer states, if one wishes to know which sound of a word possesses the greatest intensity, he should examine himself while searching for a forgotten word, for example a name. That which first returns to consciousness invariably has the greatest intensity prior to the forgetting. Thus the most important sounds are the initial sound of the root syllable and the initial sound of the word itself, as well as one or another of the accentuated vowels." End quote. Here I cannot help voicing contradiction, whether or not the initial sound of the name belongs to the most important elements of the word. It is surely not true that in the case of the forgetting of the word, it first returns to consciousness. The above rule is therefore of no use. When we observe ourselves during the search for a forgotten name, we are comparatively often forced to express the opinion that it begins with a certain letter. This conviction proves to be as often unfounded as founded. Indeed, I would even go so far as to assert that in the majority of cases one reproduces a false initial sound. Also, in our example Signorelli, the substitutive name lacked the initial sound, and the principal syllables were lost. On the other hand, the less important pair of syllables, Eli, returned to consciousness in the substitutive name Botticelli. How little substitutive names respect the initial sound of the lost names may be learned from the following case. One day I found it impossible to recall the name of the small country whose capital is Monte Carlo. The substitutive names were as follows, Piedmont, Albania, Montevideo, Calico. In place of Albania, Montenegro soon appeared, 
and then it struck me that the syllable mon occurred in all but the last of the substitutive names it thus became easy for me to find from the name of prince albert the forgotten name monaco calico practically imitates the syllabic sequence and rhythm of the forgotten word if we admit the conjecture that a mechanism similar to that pointed out in the forgetting of names may also play a part in the phenomena of speech blunders we are then led to a better founded judgment of cases of speech blunders the speech disturbance which manifests itself as a speech blunder may in the first place be caused by the influence of another component of the same speech that is through a foresound or an echo or through another meaning within the sentence or context which differs from that which the speaker wishes to utter in the second place however the disturbance could be brought about analogously to the process in the case of signorelli through influences outside the word sentence or context from elements which we did not intend to express and of whose incitement we became conscious only through the disturbance in both modes of origin of the mistaken speech the common element lies in the simultaneity of the stimulus while the differentiating elements lie in the arrangement within or without the same sentence or context the difference does not at first appear as wide as when it is taken into consideration in certain conclusions drawn from the symptomatology of speech mistakes it is clear however that only in the first case is there a prospect of drawing conclusions from the manifestations of speech blunders concerning a mechanism which connects together sounds and words for the reciprocal influence of their articulation that is conclusions such as the philologist hopes to gain from the study of speech blunders in the case of disturbance through influence outside of the same sentence or context it would before all be a question of becoming acquainted with the disturbing elements and then the question would arise whether the mechanism of this disturbance cannot also suggest the probable laws of the formation of speech we cannot maintain that Meringer and meyer have overlooked the possibility of speech disturbance through complicated psychic influences that is through elements outside the same word or sentence or the same sequence of words indeed they must have observed that the theory of the psychic variation of sounds applies strictly speaking only to the explanation of sound disturbance as well as to foresounds and after sounds when the word disturbances cannot be reduced to sound disturbances as for example in the substitutions and contaminations of words they too have without hesitation sought the cause of the mistake in speech outside of the intended context and proved this state of affairs by means of fitting examples according to the author's own understanding it is some similarity between a certain word in the intended sentence and some other not intended which allows the latter to assert itself in consciousness by causing a disfigurement or a compromise formation contamination now in my work on the interpretation of dreams i have shown the part played by the process of condensation in the origin of the so-called manifest contents of the dream from the latent thoughts of the dream any similarity of objects or of word presentations between two elements of the unconscious material is taken as a cause for the formation of a third which is a composite or compromise formation this element represents both components in the dream content and in view of this origin it is frequently endowed with numerous contradictory individual determinants the formation of substitutions and contaminations in speech mistakes is therefore the beginning of that work of condensation which we find taking a most active part in the construction of the dream in a small essay destined for the general reader meringer advanced a theory of very practical significance for certain cases of interchanging of words especially for such cases where one word is substituted by another of opposite meaning he says we may still recall the manner in which the president of the austrian house of deputies opened the session some time ago honored sirs i announce the presence of so and so many gentlemen and therefore declare the session is closed the general merriment first attracted his attention and he corrected his mistake in the present case the probable explanation is that the president wished himself in a position to close this session from which he had little good to expect and the thought broke through at least partially a frequent manifestation 
resulting in his use of closed in place of opened that is the opposite of the statement intended numerous observations have taught me however that we frequently interchange contrasting words they are always associated in our speech consciousness they lie very close together and are easily incorrectly evoked still not in all cases of contrast substitution is it so simple as in the example of the president as to appear plausible that the speech mistake occurs merely as a contradiction which arises in the inner thought of the speaker opposing the sentence uttered we have found the analogous mechanism in the analysis of the example aliquis there the intercontradiction asserts itself in the form of forgetting a word instead of a substitution through its opposite but in order to adjust the difference we may remark that the little word aliquis is incapable of a contrast similar to closing and opening and that the word opening cannot be subject to forgetting on account of its being a common component of speech having been shown by the last examples of meringer and meyer that speech disturbance may be caused through the influence of four sounds after sounds words from the same sentence that were intended for expression as well as through the effect of words outside the sentence intended the stimulus of which would otherwise not have been suspected we shall next wish to discover whether we can definitely separate the two classes of mistakes in speech and how we can distinguish the example of the one from a case of the other class but at this stage of the discussion we must also think of the assertions of wundt who deals with the manifestations of speech mistakes in his recent work on the development of language psychic influences according to wundt never lack in these as well as in other phenomena related to them Quote, the uninhibited stream of sound and word associations stimulated by spoken sounds belongs here in the first place as a positive determinant this is supported as a negative factor by the relaxation or suppression of the influences of the will which inhibit this stream and by the active attention which is here a function of volition whether that play of association manifests itself in the fact that a coming sound is anticipated or a preceding sound reproduced or whether a familiar practiced sound becomes intercalated between others or finally whether it manifests itself in the fact that altogether different sounds associatively related to the spoken sounds act upon these all these questions designate only differences in the direction and at most in the play of the occurring associations but not in the general nature of the same in some cases it may be also doubtful to which form a certain disturbance may be attributed or whether it would not be more correct to refer such disturbance to a concurrence of many motives following the principle of the complication of causes End quote. I consider these observations of want as absolutely justified and very instructive. Perhaps we could emphasize with even greater firmness than want that the positive factor favoring mistakes in speech, the uninhibited stream of associations, and its negative, the relaxation of the inhibiting attention, regularly attain synchronous action, so that both factors become only different determinants of the same process with the relaxation or more unequivocally expressed through this relaxation of the inhibiting attention the uninhibited stream of associations becomes active among the examples of the mistakes in speech collected by me i can scarcely find one in which i would be obliged to attribute the speech disturbance simply and solely to what wundt calls contact effect of sound almost invariably i discover besides this a disturbing influence of something outside the intended speech the disturbing element is either a single unconscious thought which comes to light through the speech blunder and can only be brought to consciousness through a searching analysis or it is a more general psychic motive which directs itself against the entire speech example a seeing my daughter make an unpleasant face while biting into an apple i wish to quote the following couplet the a p is a funny sight when in the apple he does bite but i began with the apple which seems to be a contamination of ape and apple compromise formation 
or it may be also conceived as an anticipation of the prepared apple the true state of affairs however was this i began the quotation once before and made no mistake the first time i made the mistake only during the repetition which was necessary because my daughter having been distracted from another side did not listen to me this repetition with the added impatience to disburden myself of the sentence i must include in the motivation of the speech blunder which represented itself as a function of condensation b my daughter said i wrote to mrs schlesinger the woman's name was schlesinger this speech blunder may depend on the tendency to facilitate articulation i must state however that this mistake was made by my daughter a few moments after i had said ape instead of ape mistakes in speech are in a great measure contagious a similar peculiarity was noticed by meringer and meyer in the forgetting of names i know of no reason for this psychic contagiousness c i sat up like a pocket-knife said a patient in the beginning of treatment instead of i shut up this suggests a difficulty of articulation which may serve as an excuse for the interchanging of sounds when her attention was called to the speech blunder she promptly replied yes that happened because you said earnest instead of earnest as a matter of fact i received her with the remark to-day we shall be in earnest because it was the last hour before her discharge from treatment and i jokingly changed the word into earnest in the course of the hour she repeatedly made mistakes in speech and i finally observed that it was not only because she imitated me but because she had a special reason in her unconscious to linger at the word earnest ernst as a name d a woman speaking about a game invented by her children and called by them the man in the box said the manx in the box i could readily understand her mistake it was while analyzing her dream in which her husband is depicted as very generous in money matters just the reverse of reality that she made this speech blunder the day before she had asked for a new set of furs which her husband denied her claiming that he could not afford to spend so much money she upbraided him for his stinginess for putting away so much into the strong box and mentioned a friend whose husband has not nearly his income and yet he presented his wife with a mink coat for her birthday the mistake is now comprehensible the word manx refers to the minx which she longs for and the box refers to her husband's stinginess e a similar mechanism is shown in the mistake of another patient whose memory deserted her in the midst of a long forgotten childish reminiscence her memory failed to inform her on what part of the body the prying and lustful hand of another had touched her soon thereafter she visited one of her friends with whom she discussed summer homes asked where her cottage in m was located she answered near the mountain loin instead of the mountain lane f another patient whom i asked at the end of her visit how her uncle was answered i don't know i only see him now in flagranti the following day she said i am really ashamed of myself for having given you yesterday such a stupid answer naturally you must have thought me a very uneducated person who always mistakes the meaning of foreign words i wish to say en passant we did not know at the time where she got the incorrectly used foreign words but during the same session she reproduced a reminiscence as a continuation of the theme from the previous day in which being caught in flagranti played the principal part the mistake of the previous day had therefore anticipated the recollection which at that time had not yet become conscious g in discussing her summer plans a patient said i shall remain most of the summer in elberlon she noted her mistake and asked me to analyze it the associations to elberlon elicited seashore on the jersey coast summer resort vacation traveling this recalled traveling in europe with her cousin a topic which we had discussed the day before during the analysis of a dream the dream dealt with her dislike for this cousin and she admitted that it was mainly due to the fact that the latter was the favorite of the man whom they met together while traveling abroad during the dream analysis she could not recall the name of the city in which they met this man and i did not make any effort at the time to bring it to her consciousness as we were engrossed in a totally different problem 
when asked to focus her attention again on elberlon and reproduce her associations she said it brings to mind elba lawn lawn field and elberfield elberfeld was the lost name of the city in germany here the mistake served to bring to consciousness in a concealed manner a memory which was connected with a painful feeling h a woman said to me if you wish to buy a carpet go to merchants in matthew street i repeated then at matthews i mean at merchants it would seem that my repeating of one name in place of the other was simply the result of distraction the woman's remark really did distract me as she turned my attention to something else much more vital to me than carpet in matthew street stands the house in which my wife lived as a bride the entrance to the house was in another street and now i noticed that i had forgotten its name and could only recall it through a roundabout method the name matthew which kept my attention is thus a substitutive name for the forgotten name of the street it is more suitable than the name merchant for matthew is exclusively the name of a person while merchant is not the forgotten street too bears the name of a person i a patient consulted me for the first time and from her history it became apparent that the cause of her nervousness was largely an unhappy married life without any encouragement she went into details about her marital troubles she had not lived with her husband for about six months and she saw him last at the theatre when she saw the play officer six o six i called her attention to the mistake and she immediately corrected herself saying that she meant to say officer six 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 the name of a recent popular play i decided to find out the reason for the mistake and as the patient came to me for analytic treatment i discovered that the immediate cause of the rupture between herself and her husband was the disease which is treated by six o six k before calling on me a patient telephoned for an appointment and also wished to be informed about my consultation fee he was told that the first consultation was ten dollars after the examination was over he again asked what he was to pay and added i don't like to owe money to anyone especially to doctors i prefer to pay right away instead of pay he said play his last voluntary remarks and his mistake put me on guard but after a few more uncalled-for remarks he set me at ease by taking money from his pocket he counted four paper dollars and was very chagrined and surprised because he had no more money with him and promised to send me a check for the balance i was sure that his mistake betrayed him that he was only playing with me but there was nothing to be done at the end of a few weeks i sent him a bill for the balance and the letter was returned to me by the post office authorities marked not found l miss x spoke very warmly of mr y which was rather strange as before this she had always expressed her indifference not to say her contempt for him on being asked about this sudden change of heart she said i really never had anything against him he was always nice to me but i never gave him the chance to cultivate my acquaintance she said captivate this neologism was a contamination of cultivate and captivate and foretold the coming betrothal m an illustration of the mechanisms of contamination and condensation will be found in the following lapsus linguae speaking of miss z miss w depicted her as a very straight-laced person who was not given to levities etc miss x thereupon remarked yes that is a very characteristic description she always appealed to me as very straight-braised here the mistake resolved itself into straight-laced and brazen-faced which correspond to miss w s opinion of miss z n i shall quote a number of examples from a paper by my colleague dr steckel which appeared in the berlin tageblatt in january nineteen o four entitled unconscious confessions an unpleasant trick of my unpleasant thoughts was revealed by the following example to begin with i may state that in my capacity as a physician i never consider my remuneration but always keep in view the patient's interest only this goes without saying i was visiting a patient who was convalescing from a serious illness 
we had passed through hard days and nights i was happy to find her improved and i portrayed to her the pleasures of a sojourn to abasia concluding with if as i hope you will not soon leave your bed this obviously came from an unconscious selfish motive to be able to continue treating this wealthy patient a wish which is entirely foreign to my waking consciousness and which i would reject with indignation oh another example from dr steckel my wife engaged a french governess for the afternoons and later coming to a satisfactory agreement wished to retain her testimonials the governess begged to be allowed to keep them saying je cherche encore pour les après midi pardon pour les avant midi she apparently intended to seek another place which would perhaps offer more profitable arrangements an intention which she carried out p i was to give a lecture to a woman her husband upon whose request this was done stood behind the door listening at the end of my sermonizing which had made a visible impression i said good-bye sir to the experienced person i thus betrayed the fact that the words were directed toward the husband that i had spoken to oblige him q dr stecco reports about himself that he had under treatment at the same time two patients from trieste each of whom he always addressed incorrectly good morning mr poloni he would say to ascoli and to poloni good morning mr ascoli he was at first inclined to attribute no deeper motive to this mistake but to explain it through a number of similarities in both persons however he easily convinced himself that there the interchange of names bespoke a sort of boast that is he was acquainting each of his italian patients with the fact that neither was the only resident of trieste who came to vienna in search of his medical advice R two women stopped in front of a drug store and one said to her companion if you will wait a few moments i'll soon be back but she said movements instead she was on her way to buy some castoria for her child s mr l who was fonder of being called on than of calling spoke to me through the telephone from a nearby summer resort he wanted to know when i could pay him a visit i reminded him that it was his turn to visit me and called his attention to the fact that as he was the happy possessor of an automobile it would be easier for him to call on me we were at different summer resorts separated by almost one half hours railway trip he gladly promised to call and asked how about labor day september first will it be convenient for you when i answered affirmatively he said very well then put me down for election day november his mistake was quite plain he likes to visit me but it was inconvenient to travel so far in november we would both be in the city my analysis proved correct t a friend described to me a nervous patient and wished to know whether i could benefit him i remarked i believe that in time i can remove all his symptoms by psychoanalysis because it is a durable case wishing to say curable you i repeatedly addressed my patient as mrs smith her married daughter's name when her real name is mrs james my attention having been called to it i soon discovered that i had another patient of the same name who refused to pay for the treatment mrs smith was also my patient and paid her bills promptly v a lapsus lingue sometimes stands for a particular characteristic a young woman who is the domineering spirit in her home said of her ailing husband that he had consulted the doctor about a wholesome diet for himself and then added the doctor said that diet has nothing to do with his ailments and that he can eat and drink what i want w i cannot omit this excellent and instructive example although according to my authority it is about twenty years old a lady once expressed herself in society the very words show that they were uttered with fervor and under the pressure of a great many secret emotions yes a woman must be pretty if she is to please the men a man is much better off as long as he has five straight limbs he needs no more this example affords us a good insight into the intimate mechanisms of a mistake in speech by means of condensation and contamination it is quite obvious 
that we have here a fusion of two similar modes of expression as long as he has four straight limbs or as long as he has five senses or the term straight may be the common element of the two intended expressions as long as he has straight limbs all five should be straight it may also be assumed that both modes of expression those of the five senses and those of the straight five have cooperated to introduce into the sentence about the straight limbs first a number and then the mysterious five instead of the simple four but this fusion surely would not have succeeded if it had not expressed good sense in the form resulting from the mistake if it had not expressed a cynical truth which naturally could not be uttered unconcealed coming as it did from a woman finally we shall not hesitate to call attention to the fact that the woman's saying following its wording could just as well be an excellent witticism as a jocose speech blunder it is simply a question whether she uttered these words with conscious or unconscious intention the behavior of the speaker in the case certainly speaks against the conscious intention and thus excludes wit x owing to similarity of material i add here another case of speech blunder the interpretation of which requires less skill a professor of anatomy strove to explain the nostril which as is known is a very difficult anatomical structure to his question whether his audience grasped his ideas he received an affirmative reply the professor known for his self-esteem thereupon remarked i can hardly believe this for the number of people who understand the nostril even in a city of millions like vienna can be counted on a finger pardon me i meant to say the fingers of a hand why i am indebted to dr alf robitsek of vienna for calling my attention to two speech blunders from an old french author which i shall reproduce in the original there follows a rather lengthy story in french in the psychotherapeutic procedure which i employ in the solution and removal of neurotic symptoms i am often confronted with the task of discovering from the accidental utterances and fancies of the patient the thought contents which though striving for concealment nevertheless unintentionally betray themselves in doing this the mistakes often perform the most valuable service as i can show through most convincing and still most singular examples for example patients speak of an aunt and later without noting the mistake call her my mother or designate a husband as a brother in this way they attract my attention to the fact that they have identified these persons with each other that they have placed them in the same category which for their emotional life signifies the recurrence of the same type or a young man of twenty years presents himself during my office hours with these words i am the father of n n whom you have treated pardon me i mean the brother why he is four years older than i i understand through this mistake that he wishes to express that like the brother he too is ill through the fault of the father like his brother he wishes to be cured but that the father is the one most in need of treatment at other times an unusual arrangement of words or a forced expression is sufficient to disclose in the speech of the patient the participation of a repressed thought having a different motive hence of course as well as in finer speech disturbances which may nevertheless be subsumed as speech blunders i find that it is not the contact effects of the sound but the thoughts outside the intended speech which determine the origin of the speech blunder and also suffice to explain the newly formed mistakes in speech i do not doubt the laws whereby the sounds produce changes upon one another but they alone do not appear to me sufficiently forcible to mar the correct execution of speech in those cases which i have studied and investigated more closely they merely represent the performed mechanism which is conveniently utilized by a more remote psychic motive the latter does not however form a part of the sphere of influence of these sound relations in a large number of substitutions caused by mistakes in talking there is an entire absence of such phonetic laws in this respect i am in full accord with wundt who likewise assumes that the conditions underlying speech blunders are complex and go far beyond the contact effects of the sounds 
If I accept as certain these more remote psychic influences, following in one's expression, there is still nothing to detain me from conceding also that in accelerated speech, with a certain amount of diverted attention, the causes of speech blunder may be easily limited to the definite law of Meringer and Meyer. However, in a number of examples gathered by these authors, a more complicated solution is quite apparent. In some forms of speech blunders, we may assume that the disturbing factor is the result of striking against obscene words and meanings, the purposive disfigurement and distortion of words and phrases, which is so popular with vulgar persons, aims at nothing else but the employing of a harmless motive as a reminder of the obscene, and this sport is so frequent that it would not be at all remarkable if it appeared unintentionally and contrary to the will. I trust that the readers will not depreciate the value of these interpretations, for which there is no proof, and of these examples, which I have myself collected and explained by means of analysis. But if secretly I still cherish the expectation that even the apparent simple cases of speech blunder will be traced to a disturbance caused by a half-repressed idea outside of the intended context, I am tempted to it by a noteworthy observation of Meringer. This author asserts that it is remarkable that nobody wishes to admit having made a mistake in speaking. There are many intelligent and honest people who are offended if we tell them that they made a mistake in speaking. I would not risk making this assertion as general as does Meringer, using the term nobody, but the emotional trace which clings to the demonstration of the mistake, which manifestly belongs to the nature of shame, has its significance it may be classed with the anger displayed at the inability to recall a forgotten name, and with the surprise at the tenaciousness of an apparently indifferent memory, and it invariably points to the participation of a motive in the formation of the disturbance. The distorting of names amounts to an insult when done intentionally, and could have the same significance in a whole series of cases where it appears as unintentional speech blunders. The person who, according to Meyer's report, once said Freuder instead of Freud, because shortly before he pronounced the name Brewer, and who at another time spoke of Frewer Brudian method, was certainly not particularly enthusiastic over this method. Later, under the mistakes in writing, I shall report a case of name disfigurement, which certainly admits of no other explanation. As a disturbing element in these cases, there is an intermingling of a criticism which must be omitted, because at the time being it does not correspond to the intention of the speaker. Or it may be just the reverse. The substituted name or the adoption of the strange name signifies an appreciation of the same. The identification which is brought about by the mistake is equivalent to recognition which for the moment must remain in the background. An experience of this kind from the school days is related by Dr. Ferenzi. While in my first year at college, I was obliged to recite a poem before the whole class. It was the first experience of the kind in my life, but I was well prepared. As soon as I began my recitation, I was dismayed at being disturbed by an outburst of laughter. The professor later explained to me this strange reception. I started by giving the title, From the Distance, which was correct, but instead of giving the name of the real author, I mentioned my own. The name of the poet is Alexander Petofi. The identity of the first name with my own favored the interchange of names, but the real reason was surely the fact that I identified myself at that time with the celebrated poet hero. Even consciously I entertained for him a love and respect which verged on adoration. The whole ambition complex hides itself under this faulty action. A similar identification was reported to me concerning a young physician who timidly and reverently introduced himself to the celebrated Virchow with the following words, I am Dr. Virchow. The surprised professor turned to him and asked, Is your name also Virchow? I do not know how the ambitious young man justified his speech blunder, whether he thought of the charming excuse that he imagined himself so insignificant next to the big man that his own name slipped from him, or whether he had the courage to admit that he hoped that he too would some day be as great as the man Virchow, and that the professor should therefore not treat him in too disparaging a manner. One or both of these thoughts may have put the young man in an embarrassing position during the introduction. 
owing to very personal motives i must leave it undecided whether a similar interpretation may also apply in the case to be cited at the international congress in amsterdam in nineteen o seven my theories of hysteria were the subject of a lively discussion one of my most violent opponents in his diatribe against me repeatedly made mistakes in speech in such a manner that he put himself in my place and spoke in my name he said for example brewer and i as is well known have demonstrated etc etc when he wished to say brewer and freud the name of this opponent does not show the slightest sound similarity to my own from this example as well as from other cases of interchanging names in speech blunders we are reminded of the fact that the speech blunder can fully forego the facility afforded to it through similar sounds and can achieve its purpose if only supported in content by concealed relations in other and more significant cases it is a self-criticism an internal contradiction against one's own utterance which causes the speech blunder and even forces a contrasting substitution for the one intended we then observe with surprise how the wording of an assertion removes the purpose of the same and how the error in speech lays bare the inner dishonesty here the lapsus linguae becomes a mimicking form of expression often indeed for the expression of what one does not wish to say it is thus a means of self-betrayal brill relates i had recently been consulted by a woman who showed many paranoid trends and as she had no relatives who could cooperate with me i urged her to enter a state hospital as a voluntary patient she was quite willing to do so but on the following day she told me that her friends with whom she leased an apartment objected to her going to a hospital as it would interfere with their plans and so on i lost patience and said there is no use listening to your friends who know nothing about your mental condition you are quite incompetent to take care of your own affairs i meant to say competent here the lapsus linguae expressed my true opinion favored by chance the speech material often gives origin to examples of speech blunders which serve to bring about an overwhelming revelation of a full comic effect as shown by the following examples reported by brill a wealthy but not very generous host invited his friends for an evening dance everything went well until about eleven thirty p m when there was an intermission presumably for supper to the great disappointment of most of the guests there was no supper instead they were regaled with thin sandwiches and lemonade as it was close to election day the conversation centered on the different candidates and as the discussion grew warmer one of the guests an ardent admirer of the progressive party candidate remarked to the host you may say what you please about teddy but there is one thing that can always be relied upon he always gives you a square meal wishing to say square deal the assembled guests burst into a roar of laughter to the great embarrassment of the speaker and the host who fully understood each other while writing a prescription for a woman who was especially weighed down by the financial burden of the treatment i was interested to hear her say suddenly please do not give me big bills because i cannot swallow them of course she meant to say pills the following example illustrates a rather serious case of self-betrayal through a mistake in talking some accessory details justify full reproduction as first printed by dr a a brill while walking one night with dr frank we accidentally met a colleague dr p whom i had not seen for years and of whose private life i knew nothing we were naturally very pleased to meet again and on my invitation he accompanied us to a cafe where we spent about two hours in pleasant conversation to my question as to whether he was married he gave a negative answer and added why should a man like me marry on leaving the cafe he suddenly turned to me and said i should like to know what you would do in a case like this i know a nurse who was named as co-respondent in a divorce case the wife sued the husband for divorce and named her as co-respondent and he got the divorce i interrupted him saying you mean she got the divorce he immediately corrected himself saying yes she got the divorce and continued to tell how the excitement of the trial had affected this nurse to such an extent that she became nervous and took to drink he wanted me to advise him how to treat her as soon as i had corrected his mistake i asked him to explain it but as is usually the case he was surprised at my question 
he wanted to know whether a person had no right to make mistakes in talking i explained to him that there is a reason for every mistake and that if he had not told me that he was unmarried i would say that he was the hero of the divorce case in question and that the mistake showed that he wished he had obtained the divorce instead of his wife so as not to be obliged to pay alimony and to be permitted to marry again in new york state he stoutly denied my interpretation but his emotional agitation followed by loud laughter only strengthened my suspicions to my appeal that he should tell the truth for science sake he said unless you wish me to lie you must believe that i was never married and hence your psychoanalytic interpretation is all wrong he however added that it was dangerous to be with a person who paid attention to such little things then he suddenly remembered that he had another appointment and left us both dr frink and i were convinced that the interpretation of his lapsus linguae was correct and i decided to corroborate or disprove it by further investigation the next day i found a neighbor an old friend of dr p who confirmed my interpretation in every particular the divorce was granted to dr p s wife a few weeks before and a nurse was named as co-respondent a few weeks later i met dr p and he told me that he was thoroughly convinced of the freudian mechanisms the self-betrayal is just as plain in the following case reported by otto rank a father who was devoid of all patriotic feeling and desirous of educating his children to be just as free from this superfluous sentiment reproached his sons for participating in a patriotic demonstration and rejected their reference to a similar behavior of their uncle with these words you are not obliged to imitate him why he is an idiot the astonished features of the children at their father's unusual tone aroused him to the fact that he had made a mistake and he remarked apologetically of course i wish to say patriot when such a speech blunder occurs in a serious squabble and reverses the intended meaning of one of the disputants it at once puts him at a disadvantage with his adversary a disadvantage which the latter seldom fails to utilize this clearly shows that although people are unwilling to accept the theory of my conception and are not inclined to forego the convenience that is connected with the tolerance of a faulty action they nevertheless interpret speech blunders and other faulty acts in a manner similar to the one presented in this book the merriment and derision which are sure to be evoked at the decisive moment through such linguistic mistakes speak conclusively against the generally accepted convention that such a speech blunder is a lapsus linguae and psychologically of no importance it was no less a man than the german chancellor who endeavored to save the situation through such a protest when the wording of his defense of his emperor november nineteen o seven turned into the opposite through speech blunder concerning the present a new epic of emperor wilhelm ii i can only repeat what i said a year ago that it would be unfair and unjust to speak of a coterie of responsible advisers around our emperor loud calls irresponsible to speak of irresponsible advisers pardon the lapsus linguae a nice example of speech blunder which aims not so much at the betrayal of the speaker as at the enlightenment of the listener outside the scene is found in wallenstein Pocolomini, act one scene five and shows us that the poet who here uses this means is well versed in the mechanism and intent of speech blunders in the preceding scene max Pocolomini was passionately in favor of the ducal party and was enthusiastic about the blessings of the peace which became known to him in the course of a journey while accompanying wallenstein's daughter to the encampment he leaves his father and the court ambassador questenberg in great consternation the scene proceeds as follows questenberg woe unto us are matters thus friend should we allow him to go there with the false opinion and not recall him at once in order to open his eyes instantly octavio rousing himself from profound meditation he has already opened mine and i see more than pleases me questenberg what is it friend octavio a curse on that journey questenberg why what is it octavio come i must immediately follow the unlucky trail must see with my own eyes come wishes to lead him away questenberg what is the matter where octavio urging to her 
Questionberg. To Octavio corrects himself. To the Duke. Let us go. The slight speech blunder to her in place of to him is meant to betray to us the fact that the father has seen through his son's motive for espousing the other cause, while the courtier complains that he speaks to him altogether in riddles. Another example wherein a poet makes use of a speech blunder was discovered by Otto Rank in Shakespeare. I quote Rank's report from Zentroblatt für Psychoanalyse, 1.3. A poetic speech blunder, very delicately motivated and technically remarkably utilized, which, like the one pointed out by Freud in Wallenstein, not only shows that poets know the mechanism and sense of this error, but also presupposes an understanding of it on the part of the hearer, can be found in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice, Act Three, Scene Two. By the will of her father, Portia was bound to select a husband through a lottery. She escaped all her distasteful suitors by lucky chance. When she finally found in Bosanio the suitor after her own heart, she had cause to fear lest he, too, should draw the unlucky lottery. In the scene she would like to tell him that even if he chose the wrong casket, he might nevertheless be sure of love. But she is hampered by her vow. In this mental conflict, the poet uses these words in her mouth, which were directed to the welcome suitor. There is something tells me, but it is not love. I would not lose you, and you know yourself, hate counsels not in such a quality. But lest you should not understand me well, and yet a maiden hath no tongue but thought, I would detain you here some month or two, before you venture for me. I could teach you how to choose right, but then I am forsworn, so will I never be, so may you miss me. But if you do, you'll make me wish a sin, that I had been forsworn. Beshrew your eyes, they have overlooked me and divided me. One half of me is yours, the other half yours. Mine own, I would say, but if mine, then yours, and so all yours. Just the very thing which she would like to hint to him gently, because really she would keep it from him, namely, that even before the choice she is wholly his, that she loves him, the poet, with admirable psychologic sensitiveness, allows to come to the surface in the speech blunder. It is through this artifice that he manages to allay the intolerable uncertainty of the lover, as well as the like tension of the hearer concerning the outcome of the choice. The interest merited by the confirmation of our conception of speech blunders through the great poets justifies the citation of a third example which was reported by Dr. E. Jones. Our great novelist, George Meredith, in his masterpiece, The Egoist, shows an even finer understanding of the mechanism. The plot of the novel is shortly as follows. Sir Willoughby Patterne, an aristocrat greatly admired by his circle, becomes engaged to Miss Constantia Durham. She discovers in him an intense egoism, which he skilfully conceals from the world, and to escape the marriage she elopes with a Captain Oxford. Some years later Patterne becomes engaged to a Miss Clara Middleton, and most of the book is taken up with a detailed description of the conflict that arises in her mind on also discovering his egotism external circumstances and her conception of honor hold her to her pledge while he becomes more and more distasteful in her eyes she partly confided in her cousin and secretary vernon whitford the man whom she ultimately marries but from a mixture of motives he stands aloof in the soliloquy clara speaks as follows if some noble gentleman could see me as i am and not disdain to aid me oh to be caught out of this prison of thorns and brambles i cannot tear my own way out i am a coward a beckoning of a finger would change me i believe i could fly bleeding and through hootings to a comrade constantia met a soldier perhaps she prayed and her prayer was answered she did ill but oh how i love her for it his name was harry oxford she did not waver she cut the links she signed herself over O oh, brave girl, what do you think of me? But I have no Harry Whitford. I am alone. The sudden consciousness that she had put another name for Oxford struck her a buffet, drowning her in crimson. 
the fact that both men's names end in ford evidently renders the confounding of them more easy and would by many be regarded as an adequate cause for this but the real underlying motive for it is plainly indicated by the author in another passage the same lapsus occurs and is followed by a hesitation and change of subject that one is familiar with in psychoanalysis when a half-conscious complex is touched sir willoughby patronizingly says to whitford false alarm the resolution to do anything unaccustomed is quite beyond poor old vernon clara replies but if mr oxford whitford your swans coming sailing up the lake how beautiful they are when they are indignant i was going to ask you surely men witnessing a marked admiration for some one else will naturally be discouraged sir willoughby stiffened with sudden enlightenment in still another passage clara by another lapsus betrays her secret wish that she was on a more intimate footing with vernon whitford speaking to a boy friend she says tell mr vernon tell mr whitford the conception of speech blunders here defended can be readily verified in the smallest details i have been able to demonstrate repeatedly that the most insignificant and most natural cases of speech blunders have their good sense and admit of the same interpretation as the most striking examples a patient who contrary to my wishes but with firm personal motives decided upon a short trip to budapest justified herself by saying that she was going for only three days but she blundered said only three weeks she betrayed her secret feeling that to spite me she preferred spending three weeks to three days in that society which i considered unfit for her one evening wishing to excuse myself for not having called for my wife at the theatre i said i was at the theatre at ten minutes after ten i was corrected you mean to say ten o'clock naturally i wanted to say before ten after ten would certainly be no excuse i had been told that the theatre program read finished before ten o'clock when we arrived at the theatre i found the foyer dark and the theatre empty evidently the performance was over earlier and my wife did not wait for me when i looked at the clock it still wanted five minutes to ten i determined to make my case more favourable at home and say that it was ten minutes to ten unfortunately the speech blunder spoiled the intent and laid bare my dishonesty in which i acknowledged more than there really was to confess this leads to those speech disturbances which can no longer be described as speech blunders for they do not injure the individual word but affect the rhythm and execution of the entire speech as for example the stammering and stuttering of embarrassment but here as in the former cases it is the inner conflict that is betrayed to us through the disturbance in speech i really do not believe that any one will make mistakes in talking in an audience with his majesty in a serious love declaration or in defending one's name and honor before a jury in short people make no mistakes when they are all there as the saying goes even in criticizing an author's style we are allowed and accustomed to follow the principle of explanation which we cannot miss in the origin of a single speech blunder a clear and unequivocal manner of writing shows us that here the author is in harmony with himself but where we find a forced and involved expression aiming at more than one target as appropriately expressed we can thereby recognize the participation of an unfinished and complicated thought or we can hear through it the stifled voice of the author's self-criticism end of section five Section 6 of Psychopathology of Everyday Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Read by Mary Schneider. Chapter 6 Mistakes in Reading and Writing. That the same viewpoints and observation should hold true for mistakes in reading and writing as for lapses in speech is not at all surprising when one remembers the inner relation of these functions. I shall here confine myself to the reports of several carefully analyzed examples and shall make no attempt to include all of the phenomena. Lapses in Reading 
a while looking over a number of leipziger illustrierten which i was holding obliquely i read as the title of the front page picture a wedding celebration in the odyssey astonished and with my attention aroused i moved the page into the proper position only to read correctly a wedding celebration in the ostsee the baltic sea how did this senseless mistake in reading come about immediately my thoughts turned to a book by ruth experimental investigations of music phantoms etc with which i had recently been much occupied as it closely touched the psychologic problems that are of interest to me the author promised a work in the near future to be called analysis and principles of dream phenomena no wonder that i having just published an interpretation of dreams awaited the appearance of this book with the most intense interest in ruth's work concerning music phantoms i found an announcement in the beginning of the table of contents of the detailed inductive proof that the old hellenic myths and traditions originated mainly from slumber and music phantoms from dream phenomena and from deliria thereupon i had immediately plunged into the text in order to find out whether he was also aware that the scene where odysseus appears before nausicaa was based upon the common dream of nakedness one of my friends called my attention to the clever passage in g keller's grunem heinrich which explains this episode in the odyssey as an objective representation of the dream of the mariner straying far from home i added to it the reference to the exhibition dream of nakedness b a woman who is very anxious to get children always reads storks instead of stocks c one day i received a letter which contained very disturbing news i immediately called my wife and informed her that poor mrs william h was seriously ill and was given up by the doctors there must have been a false ring to the words in which i expressed my sympathy as my wife grew suspicious asked to see the letter and expressed her opinion that it could not read as stated by me because no one calls the wife by the husband's name moreover the correspondent was well acquainted with the christian name of the woman concerned i defended my assertion obstinately and referred to the customary visiting cards on which a woman designates herself by the christian name of her husband i was finally compelled to take up the letter and as a matter of fact we read therein poor w m what is more i had even overlooked poor dr w m my mistake in reading signified a spasmodic effort so to speak to turn the sad news from the man towards the woman the title between the adjective and the name did not go well with my claim that the woman must have been meant that is why it was omitted in the reading the motive for this falsifying was not that the woman was less an object of my sympathy than the man but the fate of this poor man had excited my fears regarding another and nearer person who i was aware had the same disease d both irritating and laughable is a lapse in reading to which i am frequently subject when i walk through the streets of a strange city during my vacation i then read antiquities on every shop sign that shows the slightest resemblance to the word this displays the questing spirit of the collector e in his important work bluller relates quote, while reading i once had the intellectual feeling of seeing my name two lines below to my astonishment i found only the words blood corpuscles of the many thousands of lapses in reading in the peripheral as well as in the central field of vision that i have analyzed this was the most striking case whenever i imagined that i saw my name the word that induced this illusion usually showed a greater resemblance to my name than to the words blood corpuscles in most cases all the letters of my name had to be close together before i could commit such an error in this case however i could readily explain the delusion of reference and the illusion 
what i had just read was the end of a statement concerning a form of bad style in scientific works a tendency from which i am not entirely free End quote. lapses in writing a on a sheet of paper containing principally short daily notes of business interest i found to my surprise the incorrect date thursday october twentieth bracketed under the correct date of the month of september it was not difficult to explain this anticipation as the expression of a wish a few days before i had returned fresh from my vacation and felt ready for any amount of professional work but as yet there were few patients on my arrival i had found a letter from a patient announcing her arrival on the twentieth of october as i wrote the same date in september i may certainly have thought x ought to be here already what a pity about that whole month and with this thought i pushed the current date a month ahead in this case the disturbing thought can scarcely be called unpleasant therefore after noticing this lapse in writing i immediately knew the solution in the fall of the following year i experienced an entirely analogous and similarly motivated lapse in writing e jones has made a study of similar cases and found that most mistakes in writing dates are motivated b i received the proof sheets of my contribution to the annual report on neurology and psychiatry and i was naturally obliged to review with special care the names of authors which because of the many different nationalities represented offer the greatest difficulties to the compositor as a matter of fact i found some strange sounding names still in need of correction but oddly enough the compositor had corrected one single name in my manuscript and with very good reason i had written buckerhard which the compositor guessed to be burkhard i had praised the treatise of this obstetrician entitled the influence of birth on the origin of infantile paralysis and i was not conscious of the least enmity toward him but an author in vienna who had angered me by an adverse criticism of my tromdutung bears the same name it was as if in writing the name burkhard meaning the obstetrician a wicked thought concerning the other b had obtruded itself the twisting of the name as i have already stated in regard to lapses in speech often signifies a depreciation c the following is seemingly a serious case of lapsus calami which it would be equally correct to describe as an erroneously carried out action i intended to withdraw from the postal savings bank the sum of three hundred crowns which i wished to send to an absent relative to enable him to take treatment at a watering place i noted that my account was four thousand three hundred and eighty crowns and i decided to bring it down to the round sum of four thousand crowns which was not to be touched in the near future after making out the regular check i suddenly noticed that i had written not three hundred and eighty crowns as i had intended but exactly four hundred and thirty eight crowns i was frightened at the untrustworthiness of my action i soon realized that my fear was groundless as i had not grown poorer than i was before but i had to reflect for quite a while in order to discover what influence diverted me from my first intention without making itself known to my consciousness first i got on a wrong track i subtracted three eighty from four thirty eight but after that i did not know what to do with the difference finally an idea occurred to me which showed me the true connection four thirty eight is exactly ten per cent of the entire account of four thousand three hundred and eighty crowns but the bookseller too gives a ten per cent discount i recalled that a few days before i had selected several books in which i was no longer interested in order to offer them to the bookseller for three hundred crowns he thought the price demanded too high but promised to give me a final answer within the next few days if he should accept my first offer he would replace the exact sum that i was to spend on the sufferer there is no doubt that i was sorry about this expenditure the emotion at the realization of my mistakes can be more easily understood as a fear of growing poor through such outlays but both the sorrow over this expense and the fear of poverty connected with it were entirely foreign to my consciousness 
i did not regret this expense when i promised the sum and i would have laughed at the idea of any such underlying motive i should probably not have assigned such feelings to myself had not my psychoanalytic practice made me quite familiar with the repressed elements of psychic life and if i had not had a dream a few days before which brought forth the same solution d although it is usually difficult to find the person responsible for a printer's errors the psychologic mechanisms underlying them are the same as in other mistakes typographical errors also well demonstrate the fact that people are not at all indifferent to such trivialities as mistakes and judging by the indignant reactions of the parties concerned one is forced to the conclusion that mistakes are not treated by the public at large as mere accidents this state of affairs is very well summed up in the following editorial from the new york times of april fourteenth nineteen thirteen not the least interesting are the comments of the keen-witted editor who seems to share our views Quote, a blunder truly unfortunate typographical errors come only too frequently from even the best regulated newspaper presses they are always humiliating often a cause of anger and occasionally dangerous but now and then they are distinctly amusing this latter quality they are most apt to have when they are made in the office of a journalistic neighbor a fact that probably explains why we can read with smiling composure an elaborate editorial apology which appears in the hartford current its able political commentator tried the other day to say unfortunately for connecticut j h is no longer a member of congress printer and proofreader combined to deprive the adverb of its negative particle at least the able political commentator so declares and we wouldn't question his veracity for the world but sorrowful experience has taught most of us that it's safer to get that sort of editorial disclaimer of responsibility into print before looking up the copy and perhaps just perhaps the world enlightener who knows that he wrote unfortunate because that is what he intended to write didn't rashly change the discovery of his own guilt before he convicted the composing room of it be that as it may the meaning of the sentence was cruelly changed and a friend was grieved or offended not so long ago a more astonishing error than this one crept into a book review of ours a very solemn and scientific book it consisted of the substitution of the word caribou for the word carbon in a paragraph dealing with the chemical composition of the stars in this case the writer's fierce self-exculpation is at least highly plausible as it seems hardly possible that he wrote caribou when he intended to write carbon but even he was cautious enough to make no deep inquiry into the matter End quote. e i cite the following case contributed by dr w steckel for the authenticity of which i can vouch quote, an almost unbelievable example of miswriting and misreading occurred in the editing of a widely circulated weekly it concerned an article of defense and vindication which was written with much warmth and great pathos the editor-in-chief of the paper read the article while the author himself naturally read it from the manuscript and proof sheets more than once everybody was satisfied when the printer's reader suddenly noticed a slight error which had escaped the attention of all there it was plainly enough our readers will bear witness to the fact that we have always acted in a selfish manner for the good of the community it is quite evident that it was meant to read unselfish the real thoughts however broke through the pathetic speech with elemental force End quote. f the following example of misprinting is taken from a western gazette the teacher was giving an instruction paper on mathematical methods and spoke of a plan for the instruction of youth that might be carried out ad libidinem g even the bible did not escape misprints thus we have the wicked bible so called from the fact that the negative was left out of the seventh commandment this authorized edition of the bible was published in london in sixteen thirty one and it is said that the printer had to pay a fine of two thousand pounds for the omission 
another biblical misprint dates back to the year fifteen eighty and is found in the bible of the famous library of wolfenbuttel in hesse in the passage in genesis where god tells eve that adam shall be her master and shall rule over her the german translation is under soldein herr sein the word herr master was substituted by nar which means fool newly discovered evidence seems to show that the error was a conscious machination of the printer's suffragette wife who refused to be ruled by her husband h dr ernest jones reports the following case concerning a a brill Quote, although by custom almost a teetotaler he yielded to a friend's importunity one evening in order to avoid offending him and took a little wine during the next morning an exacerbation of an eye-strain headache gave him cause to regret this slight indulgence and his reflection on the subject found expression in the following slip of the pen having occasion to write the name of a girl mentioned by a patient he wrote not ethel e t h e l but ethel e t h y l it happened that the girl in question was rather too fond of drink and in dr brill's mood at the time this characteristic of hers stood out with conspicuous significance i a woman wrote to her sister felicitating her on the occasion of taking possession of a new and spacious residence a friend who was present noticed that the writer put the wrong address on the letter and what was still more remarkable was the fact that she did not address it to the previous residence but to one long ago given up but which her sister had occupied when she first married when the friend called her attention to it the writer remarked you are right but what in the world made me do this to which her friend replied perhaps you begrudge her the nice big apartment into which she has just moved because you yourself are cramped for space and for that reason you put her back in her first residence where she was no better off than yourself of course i begrudge her the new apartment she honestly admitted as an afterthought she added it is a pity that one is so mean in such matters K ernest jones reports the following example given to him by dr a a brill in a letter to dr brill a patient tried to attribute his nervousness to business worries and excitement during the cotton crisis he went on to say quote, my trouble is all due to that frigid wave there isn't even any seed to be obtained for new crops End quote he referred to a cold wave which had destroyed the cotton crops but instead of writing wave he wrote wife in the bottom of his heart he entertained reproaches against his wife on account of her marital frigidity and childlessness and he was not far from the cognition that the enforced abstinence played no little part in the causation of his malady omissions in writing are naturally explained in the same manner as mistakes in writing a remarkable example of omission which is of historic importance was reported by dr b datner in one of the legal articles dealing with the financial obligations of both countries which was drawn up in the year eighteen sixty seven during the readjustment between austria and hungary the word effective was accidentally omitted in the hungarian translation datner thinks it probable that the unconscious desire of the hungarian lawmakers to grant austria the least possible advantages had something to do with this omission another example of omission is the following related by brill Quote, a prospective patient who had corresponded with me relative to treatment finally wrote for an appointment for a certain day instead of keeping his appointment he sent regrets which began as follows owing to foreseen circumstances i am unable to keep my appointment he naturally meant to write unforeseen he finally came to me months later and in the course of the analysis i discovered that my suspicions at the time were justified there were no unforeseen circumstances to prevent his coming at that time he was advised not to come to me the unconscious does not lie End quote wundt gives a most noteworthy proof for the easily ascertained fact that we more easily make mistakes in writing than in speaking he states quote, in the course of normal conversation the inhibiting function of the will is constantly directed toward bringing into harmony the course of ideation with the movement of articulation 
if the articulation following the ideas becomes retarded through mechanical causes as in writing anticipations then readily make their appearance observation of the determinants which favor lapses in reading gives rise to doubt which i do not like to leave unmentioned because i am of the opinion that it may become the starting point of a fruitless investigation it is a familiar fact that in reading aloud the attention of the reader often wanders from the text and is directed toward his own thoughts the results of this deviation of attention are often such that when interrupted and questioned he cannot even state what he was reading in other words he has read automatically although the reading was nearly always correct i do not think that such conditions favor any noticeable increase in the mistakes we are accustomed to assume concerning a whole series of functions that they are most precisely performed when done automatically with scarcely any conscious attention this argues that the conditions governing attention in mistakes in speaking writing and reading must be differently determined than assumed by want cessation or diminution of attention the examples which we have subjected to analysis have really not given us the right to take for granted a quantitative diminution of attention we found what is probably not exactly the same thing a disturbance of the attention through a strange obtruding thought end of section six seven of psychopathology of everyday life this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Psychopathology of Everyday Life by Sigmund Freud Translation by A. A. Brill Read by Mary Schneider Chapter 7 Forgetting of Impressions and Resolutions If any one should be inclined to overrate the state of our present knowledge of mental life, all that would be needed to force him to assume a modest attitude would be to remind him of the function of memory no psychologic theory has yet been able to account for the connection between the fundamental phenomena of remembering and forgetting indeed even the complete analysis of that which one can actually observe has as yet scarcely been grasped Today, forgetting has perhaps grown more puzzling than remembering especially since we have learned from the study of dreams and pathologic states that even what for a long time we believed forgotten may suddenly return to consciousness to be sure we are in possession of some viewpoints which we hope will receive general recognition thus we assume that forgetting is a spontaneous process to which we may ascribe a certain temporal discharge we emphasize the fact that just as among the units of every impression of experience in forgetting too a certain selection takes place among the existing impressions we are acquainted with some of the conditions that underlie the tenaciousness of memory and the awakening of that which would otherwise remain forgotten nevertheless we can observe in innumerable cases of daily life how unreliable and unsatisfactory our knowledge of the mechanism is thus we may listen to two persons exchanging reminiscences concerning the same outward impressions say of a journey that they have taken together some time before what remains most firmly in the memory of the one is often forgotten by the other as if it had never occurred even when there is not the slightest reason to assume that this impression is of greater psychic importance for one than for the other a great many of those factors which determine the selective power of memory are obviously still beyond our kin with the purpose of adding some small contribution to the knowledge of the conditions of forgetting i was wont to subject to a psychologic analysis those cases in which forgetting concerned me personally as a rule i took up only a certain group of those cases namely those in which the forgetting astonished me because in my opinion i should have remembered the experience in question i wish further to remark that i am generally not inclined to forgetfulness of things experienced not of things learned and that for a short period of my youth i was able to perform extraordinary feats of memory when i was a schoolboy it was quite natural for me to be able to repeat from memory the page of a book which i had read 
and shortly before i entered the university i could write down practically verbatim the popular lectures on scientific subjects directly after hearing them in the tension before the final medical examination i must have made use of the remnant of this ability for in certain subjects i gave the examiners apparently automatic answers which proved to be exact reproductions of the textbook which i had skimmed through but once and then in greatest haste since those days i have steadily lost control over my memory of late however i became convinced that with the aid of a certain artifice i can recall far more than i would otherwise credit myself with remembering for example when during my office hours a patient states that i have seen him before and i cannot recall either the fact or the time then i help myself by guessing that is i allow a number of years beginning from the present time to come to mind quickly whenever this could be controlled by records of definite information from the patient it was always shown that in over ten years i have seldom missed by more than six months the same thing happens when i meet a casual acquaintance and from politeness inquire about his small child when he tells of its progress i try to fancy how old the child now is i control my estimate by the information given by the father and at most i make a mistake of a month and in older children of three months i cannot state however what basis i have for this estimate of late i have grown so bold that i always offer my estimate spontaneously and still run no risk of grieving the father by displaying my ignorance in regard to his offspring thus i extend my conscious memory by invoking my larger unconscious memory i shall report some striking examples of forgetting which for the most part i have observed in myself i distinguish forgetting of impressions and experiences that is the forgetting of knowledge from forgetting of resolutions that is the forgetting of omissions the uniform result of the entire series of observations i can formulate as follows the forgetting in all cases is proved to be founded on a motive of displeasure forgetting of impressions and knowledge a during the summer my wife once made me very angry although the cause in itself was trifling we sat in a restaurant opposite a gentleman from vienna whom i knew and who had cause to know me and whose acquaintance i had reasons for not wishing to renew my wife who had heard nothing to the disrepute of the man opposite her showed by her actions that she was listening to his conversation with his neighbors for from time to time she asked me questions which took up the thread of their discussion i became impatient and finally irritated a few weeks later i complained to a relative about this behavior on the part of my wife but i was not able to recall even a single word of the conversation of the gentleman in the case i am usually rather resentful and cannot forget a single incident of an episode that has annoyed me my amnesia in this case was undoubtedly determined by respect for my wife a short time ago i had a similar experience i wished to make merry with an intimate friend over a statement made by my wife only a few hours earlier but i found myself hindered by the noteworthy fact that i had entirely forgotten the statement i had first to beg my wife to recall it to me it is easy to understand that my forgetting in this case may be analogous to the typical disturbance of judgment which dominates us when it concerns those nearest to us b to oblige a woman who was a stranger in vienna i had undertaken to procure a small iron safe for the preservation of documents and money when i offered my services the image of an establishment in the heart of the city where i was sure i had seen such safes floated before me with extraordinary visual vividness to be sure i could not recall the name of the street but i felt certain that i would discover the store in a walk through the city for my memory told me that i had passed it countless times to my chagrin i could not find this establishment with the safes though i walked through the inner part of the city in every direction i concluded that the only thing left to do was to search through a business directory and if that failed to try to identify the establishment in a second round of the city it did not however require so much effort among the addresses in the directory i found one which immediately presented itself as that which had been forgotten 
it was true that i had passed the show window countless times each time however when i had gone to visit the m family who had lived a great many years in this identical building after this intimate friendship had turned to an absolute estrangement i had taken care to avoid the neighborhood as well as the house though without ever thinking of the reason for my action in my walk through the city searching for the safe in the show window i had traversed every street in the neighborhood but the right one and i had avoided this as if it were forbidden ground the motive of displeasure which was at the bottom of my disorientation is thus comprehensible but the mechanism of forgetting is no longer so simple as in the former example here my aversion naturally does not extend to the vendor of safes but to another person concerning whom i wish to know nothing and later transfers itself from the latter to this incident where it brings about the forgetting similarly in the case of burckhardt mentioned above the grudge against the one brought about the error in writing the name of the other the similarity of names which here established a connection between two essentially different streams of thought was accomplished in the showcase window instance by the contiguity of space and the inseparable environment moreover this latter case was more closely knit together for money played a great part in the causation of the estrangement from the family living in this house c the b and r company requested me to pay a professional call on one of their officers on my way to him i was engrossed in the thought that i must already have been in the building occupied by the firm it seemed as if i used to see their signboard in a lower story while my professional visit was taking me to a higher story i could not recall however which house it was nor when i had called there although the entire matter was indifferent and of no consequence i nevertheless occupied myself with it and at last learned in the usual roundabout way by collecting the thoughts that occurred to me in this connection that one story above the floor occupied by the firm b and r was the pension fisher where i had frequently visited patients then i remembered the building which sheltered both company and the pension i was still puzzled however as to the motive that entered into play in this forgetting i found nothing disagreeable in my memory concerning the firm itself or the pension fisher or the patients living there i was also aware that it could not deal with anything very painful otherwise i hardly would have been successful in tracing the thing forgotten in a roundabout way without resorting to external aid as happened in the preceding example finally it occurred to me that a little before while starting on my way to a new patient a gentleman whom i had difficulty in recalling greeted me in the street some months previously i had seen this man in an apparently serious condition and had made the diagnosis of general paresis but later i had learned of his recovery consequently my judgment had been incorrect was it not possible that we had in this case a remission which one usually finds in dementia paralytica in that contingency my diagnosis would still be justified the influence emanating from this meeting caused me to forget the neighborhood of the b and r company and my interest to discover the thing forgotten was transferred from this case of disputed diagnosis but the associative connection in this loose inner relation was affected by means of a similarity of names the man who recovered contrary to expectation was also an officer of a large company that recommends patients to me and the physician with whom i had seen the supposed paretic bore the name of fisher the name of the pension in the house which i had forgotten d mislaying a thing really has the same significance as forgetting where we have placed it like most people delving in pamphlets and books i am well oriented about my desk and can produce what i want with one lunge what appears to others as disorder has become for me perfect order why then did i mislay a catalogue which was sent to me not long ago so that it could not be found what is more it had been my intention to order a book which i found announced therein entitled uber de Sparke, because it was written by an author whose spirited vivacious style i liked 
whose insight into psychology and whose knowledge of the cultural world i had learned to appreciate i believe that was just why i mislaid the catalogue it was my habit to lend the books of this author among my friends for their enlightenment and a few days before on returning one somebody had said his style reminds me altogether of yours and his way of thinking is identical the speaker did not know what he was stirring up with his remark years ago when i was younger and in greater need of forming alliances i was told practically the same thing by an older colleague to whom i had recommended the writings of a familiar medical author to put it in his words it is absolutely your style and manner i was so influenced by these remarks that i wrote a letter to this author with the object of bringing about a closer relation but a rather cool answer put me back in my place perhaps still earlier discouraging experiences conceal themselves behind this last one for i did not find the mislaid catalogue through this premonition i was actually prevented from ordering the advertised book although the disappearance of the catalogue formed no real hindrance as i remembered well both the name of the book and the author e another case of mislaying merits our attention on account of the conditions under which the mislaid object was rediscovered a younger man narrates as follows several years ago there were some misunderstandings between me and my wife i found her too cold and though i fully appreciated her excellent qualities we lived together without evincing any tenderness for each other one day on her return from a walk she gave me a book which she had bought because she thought it would interest me i thanked her for this mark of attention promised to read the book put it away and did not find it again so months passed during which i occasionally remembered the lost book and also tried in vain to find it about six months later my beloved mother who was not living with us became ill my wife left home to nurse her mother-in-law the patient's condition became serious and gave my wife the opportunity to show the best side of herself one evening i returned home full of enthusiasm over what my wife had accomplished and felt very grateful to her i stepped to my desk and without definite intention but with the certainty of a somnambulist i opened a certain drawer and in the very top of it i found the long missing mislaid book the following example of misplacing belongs to a type well known to every psychoanalyst i must add that the patient who experienced this misplacing has himself found the solution of it this patient whose psychoanalytic treatment had to be interrupted through the summer vacation when he was in a state of resistance and ill health put away his keys in the evening in their usual place or so he thought he then remembered that he wished to take some things from his desk where he also had put the money which he needed on the journey he was to part the next day which was the last day of treatment and the date when the doctor's fee was due but the keys had disappeared he began a thorough and systematic search through his small apartment he became more and more excited over it but his search was unsuccessful as he recognized this misplacement as a symptomatic act that is as being intentional he aroused his servant in order to continue his search with the help of an unprejudiced person after another hour he gave up the search and feared he had lost the keys the next morning he ordered new keys from the desk factory which were hurriedly made for him two acquaintances who had been with him in a cab even recalled hearing something fall to the ground as he stepped out of the cab and he was therefore convinced that the keys had slipped from his pocket they were found lying between a thick book and a thin pamphlet the latter a work of one of my pupils which he wished to take along as reading matter for his vacation they were so skilfully placed that no one would have supposed that they were there he himself was unable to replace the keys in such a position as to render them invisible the unconscious skill with which an object is misplaced on account of secret but strong motives reminds one of somnambulistic sureness the motive was naturally ill-humour over the interruption of the treatment and the secret rage over the fact that he had to pay such a high fee when he felt so ill g brill relates a man was urged by his wife to attend a social function in which he really took no interest 
yielding to his wife's entreaties he began to take his dress suit from the trunk when he suddenly thought of shaving after accomplishing this he returned to the trunk and found it locked despite a long earnest search the key could not be found a locksmith could not be found on sunday evening so that the couple had to send their regrets on having the trunk opened the next morning the lost key was found within the husband had absent-mindedly dropped the key into the trunk and sprung the lock he assured me that this was wholly unintentional and unconscious but we know that he did not wish to go to this social affair the mislaying of the key therefore lacked no motive End quote. Ernst Jones noticed in himself that he was in the habit of mislaying his pipe whenever he suffered from the effects of oversmoking. The pipe was then found in some unusual place where it did not belong, and which it normally did not occupy. If one looks over the cases of mislaying, it will be difficult to assume that mislaying is anything other than the result of an unconscious intention in the summer of nineteen o one i once remarked to a friend with whom i was then actively engaged in exchanging ideas on scientific questions these neurotic problems can be solved only if we take the position of absolutely accepting an original bisexuality in every individual to which he replied i told you that two and a half years ago while we were taking an evening walk at the time you wouldn't listen to it it is truly painful to be thus requested to renounce one's originality. I could neither recall such a conversation nor my friend's revelation. One of us must be mistaken, and according to the principle of the question, cui protest, I must be the one. Indeed, in the course of the following week, everything came back to me just as my friend had recalled it. I myself remembered that at that time I gave the answer, I have not got so far, and I do not care to discuss it. But since this incident I have grown more tolerant when I miss any mention of my name in medical literature in connection with ideas for which I deserve credit. It is scarcely accidental that the numerous examples of forgetting which have been collected without any selection should require for their solution the introduction of such painful themes as exposing one's wife a friendship that has turned into the opposite a mistake in medical diagnosis enmity on account of similar pursuits or the borrowing of somebody's ideas i am rather inclined to believe that every person who will undertake an inquiry into the motives underlying his forgetting will be able to fill up a similar sample card of vexatious circumstances the tendency to forget the disagreeable seems to me to be quite general the capacity for it is naturally differently developed in different persons certain denials which we encounter in medical practice can probably be ascribed to forgetting our conception of such forgetting confines the distinction between this and that behavior to purely psychologic relations and permits us to see in both forms of reaction the expression of the same motive of the numerous examples of denials of unpleasant recollection which i have observed in kinsmen of patients one remains in my memory as especially singular a mother telling me of the childhood of her nervous son now in his puberty made the statement that like his brothers and sisters he was subject to bedwetting throughout his childhood a symptom which certainly has some significance in the history of a neurotic patient some weeks later while seeking information regarding the treatment i had occasion to call her attention to signs of a constitutional morbid predisposition in the young man and at the same time referred to the bedwetting recounted in the anamnesis to my surprise she contested this fact concerning him denying it as well for the other children and asked me how i could possibly know this finally i let her know that she herself had told me a short time before what she had thus forgotten one also finds abundant indications which show that even in healthy not neurotic persons resistances are found against the memory of disagreeable impressions and the idea of painful thoughts but the full significance of this fact can be estimated only when we enter into the psychology of neurotic persons 
one is forced to make such elementary defensive striving against ideas which can awaken painful feelings a striving which can be put side by side only with the flight reflex in painful stimuli as the main pillar of the mechanism which carries the hysterical symptoms one need not offer any objection to the acceptance of such defensive tendency on the ground that we frequently find it impossible to rid ourselves of painful memories which cling to us or to banish such painful emotions as remorse and reproaches of conscience no one maintains that this defensive tendency invariably gains the upper hand that in the play of psychic forces it may not strike against factors which stir up the contrary feeling for other purposes and bring it about in spite of it as the architectural principle of the psychic apparatus we may conjecture a certain stratification or structure of instances deposited in strata and it is quite possible that this defense tendency belongs to a lower psychic instance and is inhibited by higher instances at all events it speaks for the existence and force of this defensive tendency when we can trace it to processes such as those found in our examples of forgetting we see then that something is forgotten for its own sake and where it is not possible the defensive tendency misses the target and causes something else to be forgotten something less significant but which has fallen into associative connection with the disagreeable material the views here developed namely that painful memories merge into motivated forgetting with special ease merits application in many spheres where as yet it has found no or scarcely any recognition thus it seems to me that it has not been strongly enough emphasized in the estimation of testimony taken in court where the putting of a witness under oath obviously leads us to place too great a trust in the purifying influence of his psychic play of forces it is universally admitted that in the origin of the traditions and folklore of a people care must be taken to eliminate from memory such a motive as would be painful to the national feeling perhaps on closer investigation it may be possible to form a perfect analogy between the manner of development of national traditions and infantile reminiscences of the individual the great darwin has formulated a golden rule for the scientific worker from his insight into his pain motive of forgetting almost exactly as in the forgetting of names faulty recollections can also appear in the forgetting of impressions and when finding credence they may be designated as delusions of memory the memory disturbance in pathological cases in paranoia it actually plays the role of a constituting factor in the formation of delusions has brought to light an extensive literature in which there is no reference whatever to its being motivated as this theme also belongs to the psychology of the neuroses it goes beyond our present treatment instead i will give from my own experience a curious example of memory disturbance showing clear enough its determination through unconscious repressed material and its connection with this material while writing the latter chapters of my volume on the interpretation of dreams i happened to be in a summer resort without access to libraries and reference books so that i was compelled to introduce into the manuscript all kinds of references and citations from memory these i naturally reserved for future correction in the chapter on daydreams i thought of the distinguished figure of the poor bookkeeper in alphonse daudet's nabab through whom the author probably described his own daydreams i imagined that i distinctly remembered one fantasy of this man whom i called mr jocelyn which he hatched while walking the streets of paris and i began to reproduce it from my memory this fantasy described how mr jocelyn boldly hurled himself at a runaway horse and brought it to a standstill how the carriage door opened and a great personage stepped from the coupe pressed mr jocelyn's hand and said you are my saviour i owe you my life what can i do for you i assured myself that casual inaccuracies in the rendition of this fantasy could readily be corrected at home on consulting the book but when i perused nabab in order to compare it with my manuscript 
i found to my very great shame and consternation that there was nothing to suggest such a dream by mr jocelyn indeed the poor bookkeeper did not even bear this name he was called mr joyeuse this second error then furnished the key for the solution of the first mistake the faulty reminiscence joyeux of which joyeuse is the feminine form was the only possible word which would translate my own name freud into french whence therefore came this falsely remembered fantasy which i had attributed to daudet it could only be a product of my own daydream which i myself had spun and which did not become conscious or which was once conscious and had been absolutely forgotten perhaps i invented it myself in paris where frequently enough i walked the streets alone and full of longing for a helper and protector until charcot took me into his circle i had often met the author of nabab in charcot's house but the provoking part of it all is the fact that there is scarcely anything to which i am so hostile as the thought of being someone's protege what we see of this sort of thing in our country spoils all desire for it and my character is little suited to the role of a protected child i have always entertained an immense desire to be the strong man myself and it had to happen that i should be reminded of such a to be sure never fulfilled daydream besides this incident is a good example of how the restraint relation to one's ego which breaks forth triumphantly in paranoia disturbs and entangles us in the objective grasp of things another case of faulty recollection which can be satisfactorily explained resembles the faux reconnaissance to be discussed later i related to one of my patients an ambitious and very capable man that a young student had recently gained admittance into the circle of my pupils by means of an interesting work der kunstler verisch einer sexual psychologie when a year and a quarter later this work lay before me in print my patient maintained that he remembered with certainly having read somewhere perhaps in a bookseller's advertisement the announcement of the same book even before i first mentioned it to him he remembered that this announcement came to his mind at that time and he ascertained besides that the author had changed the title that it no longer read versuch but ansatze zu einer sexual psychology careful inquiry of the author and comparison of all dates show conclusively that my patient was trying to recall the impossible no notice of this work had appeared anywhere before its publication certainly not a year and a quarter before it went to print however i neglected to seek a solution for this false recollection until the same man brought about an equally valuable renewal of it he thought that he had recently noticed a work on agoraphobia in the show-window of a bookshop and as he was now looking for it in all available catalogues i was able to explain to him why his effort must remain fruitless the work on agoraphobia existed only in his fantasy as an unconscious resolution to write such a book himself his ambition to emulate that young man and through such a scientific work to become one of my pupils had led him to the first as well as to the second false recollection he also recalled later that the bookseller's announcement which had occasioned his false reminiscence dealt with a work entitled genesis das gesex der Zugen, genesis the law of generation but the change in the title as mentioned by him was really instigated by me i recalled that i myself had perpetrated the same inaccuracy in the repetition of the title by saying ansatze in place of versuch forgetting of intentions no other group of phenomena is better qualified to demonstrate the thesis that lack of attention does not in itself suffice to explain faulty acts as the forgetting of intentions an intention is an impulse for an action which has already found approbation but whose execution is postponed for a suitable occasion now in the interval thus created sufficient change may take place in the motive to prevent the intention from coming to execution it is not however forgotten it is simply revised and omitted 
we are naturally not in the habit of explaining the forgetting of intentions which we daily experience in every possible situation as being due to a recent change in the adjustment of motives we generally leave it unexplained or we seek a psychologic explanation in the assumption that at the time of execution the required attention for the action which was an indispensable condition for the occurrence of the intention and was then at the disposal of the same action no longer exists observation of our normal behavior towards intentions urges us to reject this tentative explanation as arbitrary if i resolve in the morning to carry out a certain intention in the evening i may be reminded of it several times in the course of the day but it is not at all necessary that it should become conscious throughout the day as the time for its execution approaches it suddenly occurs to me and induces me to take the necessary preparation for the intended action if i go walking and take a letter with me to be posted it is not at all necessary that i as a normal not nervous individual should carry it in my hand and continually look for a letter-box as a matter of fact i am accustomed to put it in my pocket and give my thoughts free rein on my way feeling confident that the first letter-box will attract my attention and cause me to put my hand in my pocket and draw out the letter this normal behavior in a formed intention corresponds perfectly with the experimentally produced conduct of persons who are under a so-called post-hypnotic suggestion to perform something after a certain time we are accustomed to describe the phenomenon in the following manner the suggested intention slumbers in the person concerned until the time for its execution approaches then it awakes and excites the action in two positions of life even the layman is cognizant of the fact that forgetting referring to intended purposes can in no wise claim consideration as an elementary phenomenon no further reducible but realizes that it ultimately depends on unadmitted motives i refer to affairs of love and military service a lover who is late at the appointment place will vainly tell his sweetheart that unfortunately he has entirely forgotten their rendezvous she will not hesitate to answer him a year ago you would not have forgotten evidently you no longer care for me even if she should grasp the above-cited psychologic explanation and should wish to excuse his forgetting on the plea of important business he would only elicit the answer from the woman who has become as keen-sighted as the physician in the psychoanalytic treatment how remarkable that such business disturbances did not occur before of course the woman does not wish to deny the possibility of forgetting but she believes and not without reason that practically the same inference of a certain unwillingness may be drawn from the unintentional forgetting as from the conscious subterfuge similarly in military service no distinction is recognized between an omission resulting from forgetting and one in consequence of intentional neglect and rightly so the soldier dares forget nothing that military service demands of him if he forgets in spite of this even when he is acquainted with the demands then it is due to the fact that the motives which urge the fulfilment of the military exactions are opposed by contrary motives thus the one year's volunteer who at inspection pleads forgetting as an excuse for not having polished his sutton's is sure to be punished but this punishment is small in comparison to the one he courts if he admits to his superiors that the motive for his negligence is because this miserable menial service is altogether disgusting to me owing to this saving of punishment for economic reasons as it were he makes use of forgetting as an excuse or it comes about as a compromise the service of women as well as the military service of the state demands that nothing relating to that service be subject to forgetting thus it suggests that forgetting is permissible in unimportant matters but in weighty matters its occurrence is an indication that one wishes to treat weighty matters as unimportant that is that their importance is disputed the viewpoint of psychic validity is in fact not to be contested here no person forgets to carry out actions that seem important to himself without exposing himself to the suspicion of being a sufferer from mental weakness 
our investigations therefore can extend only to the forgetting of more or less secondary intentions for no intention do we deem absolutely indifferent otherwise it would certainly never have been formed as in the preceding functional disturbances i have collected the cases of neglect through forgetting which i have observed in myself and endeavored to explain them i have found that they could invariably be traced to some interference of unknown and unadmitted motives or as may be said they are due to a counter will in a number of these cases i found myself in a position similar to that of being in some distasteful service i was under a constraint to which i had not entirely resigned myself so that i showed my protest in the form of forgetting this accounts for the fact that i am particularly prone to forget to send congratulations on such occasions as births jubilees wedding celebrations and promotions to higher rank i continually make new resolutions but i am more than ever convinced that i shall not succeed i am now on the point of giving it up altogether and to admit consciously the striving motives in a period of transition i told a friend who asked me to send a congratulatory telegram for him at a certain time when i was to send one myself that i would probably forget both it was not surprising that the prophecy came true it is undoubtedly due to painful experiences in life that i am unable to manifest sympathy where this manifestation must necessarily appear exaggerated for the small amount of my feeling does not admit the corresponding expression since i have learned that i often mistook the pretended sympathy of others for real i am in rebellion against the conventions of expressing sympathy the social expediency of which i naturally acknowledge condolences in cases of death are accepted from this double treatment once i determine to send them i do not neglect them where my emotional participation has nothing more to do with social duty its expression is never inhibited by forgetting cases in which we forget to carry out actions which we have promised to do as a favor for others can similarly be explained as antagonism to conventional duty and as an unfavorable inward opinion here it regularly proves correct inasmuch as the only person appealed to believes in the excusing power of forgetfulness while the one requesting the favor has no doubt about the right answer he has no interest in this matter otherwise he would not have forgotten it there are some who are noted as generally forgetful and we excuse their lapses in the same manner as we excuse those who are short-sighted when they do not greet us in the street such persons forget all small promises which they have made they leave unexecuted all orders which they have received they prove themselves unreliable in little things and at the same time demand that we shall not take these slight offences amiss that is they do not want us to attribute these failings to personal characteristics but to refer them to an organic peculiarity i am not one of these people myself and have had no opportunity to analyze the actions of such a person in order to discover from the selection of forgetting the motive underlying the same i cannot forego however the conjecture per anagolium that here the motive is an unusual large amount of unavowed disregard for others which exploits the constitutional factor for its purpose in other cases the motives for forgetting are less easy to discover and when found excite greater astonishment thus in former years i observed that of a great number of professional calls i only forgot those that i was to make on patients whom i treated gratis or on colleagues the mortification caused by this discovery led me to the habit of noting every morning the calls of the day in a form of resolution i do not know if other physicians have come to the same practice by a similar road thus we get an idea of what causes the so-called norasthenic to make a memorandum of the communications he wishes to make to the doctor he apparently lacks confidence in the reproductive capacity of his memory this is true but the scene usually proceeds in this manner the patient has recounted his various complaints and inquiries at considerable length after he has finished he pauses for a moment then he pulls out the memorandum and says apologetically i have made some notes because i cannot remember anything 
as a rule he finds nothing new in the memorandum he repeats each point and answers it himself yes i have already asked about that by means of the memorandum he probably only demonstrates one of his symptoms the frequency with which his resolutions are disturbed through the interference of obscure motives i am touching moreover on an affliction to which even most of my healthy acquaintances are subject when i admit that especially in former years i had the habit of easily forgetting for a long time to return borrowed books also that it very often happened that i deferred payments through forgetfulness one morning not long ago i left the tobacco shop where i made my daily purchase of cigars without paying it was a most harmless omission as i am known there and could therefore expect to be reminded of my debt the next morning but this slight neglect the attempt to contract a debt was surely not unconnected with reflections concerning the budget with which i had occupied myself throughout the preceding day even among the so-called respectable people one can readily demonstrate a double behavior when it concerns the theme of money and possession the primitive greed of the suckling which wishes to seize every object in order to put it in its mouth has generally been only imperfectly subdued through culture and training i fear that in all the examples thus far given i have grown quite commonplace but it can be only a pleasure to me if i happen upon familiar matters which every one understands for my main object is to collect everyday material and utilize it scientifically i cannot conceive why wisdom which is so to speak the sediment of everyday experiences should be denied admission among the acquisitions of knowledge for it is not the diversity of objects but the stricter method of verification and the striving for far-reaching connection which make up the essential character of scientific work we have invariably found that intentions of some importance are forgotten when obscure motives arise to disturb them in still less important intentions we find a second mechanism of forgetting here a counter will becomes transferred to the resolution from something else after an external association has been formed between the latter and the content of the resolution the following example reported by brill illustrates this a patient found that she had suddenly become very negligent in her correspondence she was naturally punctual and took pleasure in letter writing but for the last few weeks she simply could not bring herself to write a letter without exerting the greatest amount of effort the explanation was quite simple some weeks before she had received an important letter calling for a categorical answer she was undecided what to say and therefore did not answer at all this decision in the form of inhibition was unconsciously transferred to other letters and caused the inhibition against letter writing in general direct counter will and more remote motivation are found together in the following example of delaying i had written a short treatise on the dream for the series grenzfragen des nerven und seelenlebens in which i gave an abstract of my book the interpretation of dreams bergman the publisher had sent me the proof sheets and asked for a speedy return of the same as he wished to issue the pamphlet before christmas i corrected the sheets the same night and placed them on my desk in order to take them to the post office the next morning in the morning i forgot all about it and only thought of it in the afternoon at the sight of the paper cover on my desk in the same way i forgot the proofs that evening and the following morning and until the afternoon of the second day when i quickly took them to a letter-box wondering what might be the basis of this procrastination obviously i did not want to send them off although i could find no explanation for such an attitude after posting the letter i entered the shop of my vienna publisher who put out my interpretation of dreams i left a few orders then as if impelled by a sudden thought said you undoubtedly know that i have written the dream book a second time ah he exclaimed then i must ask you to calm yourself i interposed it is only a short treatise for the lohenfeld corella collection but still he was not satisfied he feared that the abstract would hurt the sale of the book i disagreed with him and finally asked if i had come to you before would you have objected to the publication 
no under no circumstances he answered personally i believe i acted within my full rights and did nothing contrary to the general practice still it seems certain to me that a thought similar to that entertained by the publisher was the motive for my procrastination in dispatching the proof-sheets this reflection leads back to a former occasion when another publisher raised some difficulties because i was obliged to take out several pages of the text from an earlier work on cerebral infantile paralysis and put them unchanged into a work on the same theme in nothingale's handbook there again the reproach received no recognition that time also i had loyally informed my first publisher the same who published the interpretation of dreams of my intention however if this series of recollections is followed back still farther it brings to light a still earlier occasion relating to a translation from the french in which i really violated the property rights that should be considered in a publication i had added notes to the text without asking the author's permission and some years later i had cause to think that the author was dissatisfied with this arbitrary action there is a proverb which indicates the popular knowledge that the forgetting of intentions is not accidental it says what one forgets once he will often forget again indeed we sometimes cannot help feeling that no matter what may be said about forgetting and faulty actions the whole subject is already known to everybody as something self-evident it is strange enough that it is still necessary to push before consciousness such well-known facts how often i have heard people remark please do not ask me to do this i shall surely forget it the coming true of this prophecy later is surely nothing mysterious in itself he who speaks thus perceives the inner resolution not to carry out the request and only hesitates to acknowledge it to himself much light is thrown moreover on the forgetting of resolutions through something which could be designated as forming false resolutions i had once promised a young author to write a review of his short work but on account of inner resistances not unknown to me i promised him that it would be done the same evening i really had serious intentions of doing so but i had forgotten that i had set aside that evening for the preparation of an expert testimony that could not be deferred after i thus recognized my resolution as false i gave up the struggle against my resistances and refused the author's request End of section seven.